webinars on um, best practices for deploying HPC, for developing HPC software. Um, today's uh, speaker is Barry Smith, and the topic is uh, how to configure, build, and deploy your software with some emphasis on uh, um, the developing, uh, developing development environments also. Uh, please do make sure that you are counted and visit the page for um, making your, uh, uh, sub submitting that you uh, participated. Uh, we do want the webinar to be interactive. However, as a panelist, you will not be able to speak out your questions. So uh, you can use the Q&A and chat. And if you have any difficulty um, using the Q&A session, then uh, please go to the Google Doc and your questions will be monitored from this Google Doc also. So the way this is going to work is I will be monitoring the questions and I will be speaking them out loud to Barry who can then answer the questions at appropriate uh, points in the, during the webinar. After the webinar, the slides and recording will be available. Uh, next one, Barry. So as I said, today's topic is developing, configuring, building, and deploying HPC software. Um, next one. And to uh, reiterate, the objective of the series is to bring the knowledge of useful software engineering practices to the HPC community. What that means is that what we're not trying to do is tell you about any set of practices that must be used. Instead, our, plan, our uh, motiv motivation is to uh, inform about the practices that have been found to work well on some projects and the emphasis is on adoption of practices that help productivity rather than put unsustainable burden on individual teams we strongly encourage customization as needed and in all cases in all the webinars whatever information we are giving will be done through examples and case studies and there will be references for available resources Next one. Um, so uh, to introduce Barry, um, Barry Smith is an Argonne Distinguished Fellow in Mathematics and Computer Science Division at Argonne National Laboratory. He is a SIAM Fellow and is best known for developing PETSI. Barry. Thank you, Hunchu. <clears throat> My uh, presentation is going to be tutorial style, so it'll be typing at the keyboard mostly as opposed to uh, slides. This first slide introduces the topics I'm going to cover. I'm going to just talk a little bit in, in the uh, tutorial presentation about um, the development environments. In the HPC world, most of the development is done using uh, Emacs or the Vim editor. There's occasional people who use Eclipse, which is a portable system that works on Linux and uh, Windows and uh, Apple systems. A uh, very small number of people use Visual Studio, which works on uh, Microsoft products, and Xcode, which is the Apple system. There's advantages and disadvantages to all of these approaches, and I'll talk a little bit about that during the tutorial. I'm also going to talk about make and GNU make, that is how one compiles software and, and does that in a, an efficient manner. A little bit about the GNU autocomp tool, which produces a configure file. An alternative to using a configure is uh, another system that's um, less commonly used but still popular called CMake. I won't talk about that, but it follows a parallel in how it works compared to configure. Uh, ne the next presentation is going to be on using Git and uh, source code repositories, and I really urge you to, um, to attend the next presentation because if you're not using a, a good revision control system, you're really um, losing a lot of productivity in your development model. So as I said, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an empty file and start developing a simple code, compiling the code, making the code slightly more complicated, compiling it again, and then talking about the tools that can make that process uh, more, effic uh, more efficient over the manual process. So I made a simple C file and I can compile it with CC, produces a, a .out file. I don't want an a.out file. So 
I used a dash O option and produced the file with that name. Now let's say I want to have a program with two files in it. So I'm going to open another file, uh, util.c, put another program in there that's going to get called by the main program. And you should think of this surrogate file util.c as not being a single file, but actually being hundreds of files that are in your um, repository in your development system. Or if you're working on a very large package, thousands of files. So now I'm just going to try to compile the code again. And you see I made a mistake here because I forgot to include the name of the uh, new file that I added. And I'd have to put both of the files in. So what I'm doing now is opening what's called a make file. Now a make file is a way to coordinate compiling and management of your source code. So in this case, the make file has a, a very simple structure. The ex1 before the semicolon is called a target. It's something that's going to be made by the make file. What's listed after that are what are, what are called dependencies. So those are files that the target depends on. And when changes are made to that file, the make file is supposed to be able to know how to rebuild the target based on the files that are input. So in this simple case, I'm just saying that ex1 depends on ex1.c and util.c. And the way to generate ex1 is to run the compiler with the output argument of uh, ex1 and the two inputs, ex1.c and util.c. Now you notice when I do that, that uh, every time I um, um, compile something, it actually has to compile all the files, ex1.c and, and util.c, if either of the two files is changed. Now I'm going to add one more piece of complexity to the uh, code. I'm going to use an include file. I'll call it util.h, and I'm going to include that in one of the two source code files. So this include file is actually not going to do anything. It's just a dummy for um, explaining the situation. So now I include that into the util file. Now, if I do make, well, the make still works again. It compiles everything again. I don't really want it to recompile the um, I'm changing now the dot C's to the dot to dot O's because what was happening before was every time anything changed, it had to recompile all the source codes. So instead, by by putting up here as the dependencies dot O files, the only files that will will need to be compiled are files where the dot O is out of sync with respect to the dot C file. So now I rerun, it doesn't actually have to do anything. Now I include the uh, uh, change this file again, and you see that only the um, util file, the ex1 file that re got recompiled, not the util file. So now let's go back and make some change to the include file. And I try to make again, but what happened? Well, it didn't change anything. That's because I haven't told the make file in any way that ex1 or either of the .o files depends on the utility.h file. So we're going to do that now in the make file by simply indicating um, util.o depends on util.h. Now, when I run the make again, it has to recompile the .o. Now I'm going to make a change to the .h and run it again. Now next I'm showing in make files you can use what are called variables. So rather than hardwiring, for example, the compiler into the make file, you can make a variable at the top of the make file and then use the variable down below. And as you see when I run make here, you'll see I actually made a small mistake it, you really always have to um, put the uh, variables inside curly brackets for make. And the dollar sign curly brackets means evaluate that variable. So now the make runs correctly. Um, Barry, there is a question. Yes. Question is, are software build and install tools targeted to HPC systems like easy build um, or SPAC going to be covered at all or open HPC? 
Um, if not, any thoughts, remarks about those kinds of tools and projects? Those tools, in a sense, go above these tools. So for SPAC, SPAC is an installer, but each package has to either have made a configure system or a CMake system that SPAC then uses. SPAC does not replace those. Those SPAC is a coordinator that installs many packages, each of which individually knows how to install itself using tools we already know about. It may be this type of discussion may happen in later um, sessions, but I'm not going to talk about it today. What I'm doing is introducing the low level tools that an individual developer who's working on their own package uses to fit into the hot larger environment. Okay, so now I, I'm putting a bug into the code just to show you a nice feature of Emacs. So notice I tried to compile and there's an error there. Now normally I would then have to go over to my Emacs window and hunt around and find the where the error occurred. If it's a single file, that's easy. If you have dozens of source code files, that's annoying. So a very nice feature of uh, Emacs and I suspect Vim has something similar and all uh, integrated development environment have, have tools to help you do this very easily. Rather than running the make in the shell, I run the make in Emacs, using the Emacs compile command, I'm just removing some garbage here that I have normally for my regular development work. When I run the make, the error message comes up, but all I have to do is hit control X um, back tick and the uh, Emacs will automatically go to the file where the error is and the line number. So it makes fixing bugs much more effective than always compiling at the command line. That's just a nice little feature of these um, editors that you definitely should know about. Um, another question. Yeah. How about covering CMake as it does address for trend dependencies while traditional make does not? I am not covering CMake today. I'm talking about configure and make only. CMake's an alternative. I prefer the configure environment. CMake is an alternative that basically provides the same functionality as configure and the make environment. It's just an alternative way of working with it. So the next thing I'm gonna show you is another feature that all the integrated development environments have, as well as um, um, Emacs and Vim, which is the ability to find symbols in your source code and search through source code. So with uh, Emacs, the function that's used is called etags. With uh, Vim, I believe it's just tags. What you do is you run a command called etags where you list all the source code, for example, the .c files. You can also include the .h files that you want to um, search through. And then in Emacs, you just use visit tags table, put in the location of the table, and now you can immediately jump to symbols simply by doing an escape dot um, for this case, uh, util, and it'll jump to the actual function, no matter which file it is in. You can also do searches with tag search. IDEs have additional functionality, which is very nice, like um, um, name completion and so forth. So if you're starting to type the name of a function you want to call or a, a C++ method, it can automatically show you what are the possibilities in case you've forgotten them and so forth. Um, when you work with tools like etags, I'm just showing you that make files can be used not only to compile code, but they can also be used to manage things like generating etags. So here I put a rule in the make file etags that just runs etags on the um, source code. Of course, if you have a lot of source code, you don't want to list each of the individual pieces of source, um, every ex1.c, util.c, and so forth you'd like to manage them as, as one entity. So here, I'm simply showing, creating a variable at the top where I define the x1.c and util.c as source. And then I can go through the make file and every time that it's needed, I can put in that variable. Of course, sometimes I need the .o files instead. Make has this nice little tool where you can create a list of .o files based on the .c files using the syntax that's presented here. So now I'll just change the make file to use obj up here instead of listing the files individually. I actually make a mistake here and I forgot to uh, change the .o's on the very next line. I could also use obj there. 
So that change worked. Now I'm just going to go and test one more time uh, that the dependencies are working by putting some trivial change in the include file. Let's see how things recompile. Yeah, it goes ahead and recompiles that as, as needed. Now, instead of listing the individual files, if you have a lot of them in a directory, the makefile can automatically get the, generate the entire list um, for you from the .cs in that, in that directory with this wildcard uh, command. So again, the compiles work okay. Now you notice that I had set this um, dependency manually in the make file that util.o depends on util.each. But what if you have hundreds of include files and um, hundreds of source code files and dozens of include files with complicated dependencies? If you don't set up any dependency information, basically whenever you change any include file, just to be cautious, you're gonna have to recompile all the source code, which could take several minutes and be a waste of your time. So there's an easy way to set up dependencies where the compiler figures out exactly which source code files include which in .h files and automatically when you run the compiler determines all the dependency information. So I'm gonna show how, how you can do that using a combination of make and the, um, um, and the feature of compilers. Um, so a yep. couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, do you recommend vanilla make or do you advocate for gmake? That's a good question. And I uh, have a couple of slides later where I talk about that. Gmake is pretty portable. portable. I found it works pretty much everywhere. So there's not a huge reason not to use gmake instead of make. On the other hand, gmake, the syntax is a bit more convoluted and sometimes hard to understand. What I recommend is always using the simplest thing you can use, but add the functionality as you need it. So if you're just using generic make, but then you want to do something that's cumbersome in generic make, but you can do and can you make, then start using that feature. I don't recommend going overboard and on day one, just throwing in every feature of GNU make. Almost always it's not necessary. And uh, it makes it harder for other people to maintain the code, but there's not a reason not to use GNU make for portability in, in my mind. Okay. So when you need it, I would add that support. There are three more questions, so I'll go through all of them. Uh, while we are dealing with Emacs, a rather stupid utility question, do you or anyone else know how to get tabs functionality on GNU Emacs? Tabs functionality? That is there on uh, Aqua, uh, Aquamax. I don't know what tabs functionality So that one is open, I suppose, is open to all the participants. If anyone knows that um, answer, can you please post it on uh, the chat? The next one is can you briefly discuss how to ensure your project can be built in parallel using make minus J N? What are the things one should pay attention to? Uh, that's actually a good question. And unfortunately, I didn't think about that uh, in advance. Uh, so I don't have a complete answer for that. But it is a very good point. Once you have a lot of source code, if you're just doing a sequential make, it it will take a long time to compile while parallel makes can work much more efficiently. So the biggest thing with the parallel to accomplish good performance with a parallel make is to provide all the information that you can to the make at the same time. So for example, for many years with Petsy, we used what was called recursive make. That is we would have our make recurse through the directories and run make in each one of the individual directories one at a time. That made having a parallel make across the entire source code project impossible because it was a sequential process through there. So the first step is you really want to avoid recursive makes. And given the functionality of, of GNU make includes and so forth, it's not that hard to avoid recursive makes. So you can have a top level make that actually um, builds code that's in a variety of subdirectories at the same time. So you don't need to do a recursive make and do them sequentially. Um, otherwise, you just have to set up the dependency information. And uh, beyond that, I'm not really familiar with the details of, of what would prevent a parallel make. The important thing is put all the information 
and the rule for running that make in a single make file. So, so make has the knowledge to be able to do as much in parallel as it can. One more question. For someone new to both Emacs and Vim, which editor should be considered first? Is one easier than another to get started? That, that is a very good question. And there's a lot of controversy about it. I personally used Vim for several years when it was still VI and decided I wanted more power. So I switched to Emacs, which was painful for a couple of months. Um, I prefer Emacs, but I think it's much more how well you use the tool than which particular tool you use. So if you know five commands in Emacs and think, well, I'm doing better because I'm using Emacs, or on the other hand, someone else knows 50 commands in Vim and is very effective, then clearly the person who's using Vim is, has made the better choice. So uh, I recommend Emacs, but I think Vim is a fine choice as well. The main thing is to have some resource to help you at the beginning to utilize all the functionality and not have to do things like grepping through all your source code to find where a function is and so forth, because there are tools to make that easy. And just knowing what those tools are takes a little time, but they're available in both of the packages. And as I said before, the uh, IDEs have even more of that kind of functionality for the source code management with them. So let me uh, keep on going and we can stop in a few minutes if there's more questions coming up. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to make a new variable called uh, depths for dependencies. And all this is is a simple rule that generates .d files from all the .h files. And I'll show you in a minute what the .d files look like, but what they are is their dependency information for that particular source code file. So what I'm doing now is I'm putting in, a, this is now using a gmake functionality. This dash include depths is going to include each of these files, each of these .d files in order, just as if they were all written in the make file. But the nice thing is it can depend on this variable depths, which of course would change over time as you add more source code. In addition, I have to put a, a, another variable at the top, this uh, badly uh, named variable, in my opinion, output option, where you have to put the options for the particular compiler that you're using to generate the dependency information. So it turns out CCC and Clang, GCC and Clang, both manage to use these same options to uh, generate the dependency information. So now I'm going and, and touching the files in order to recompile everything force a recompile of everything. So everything's been recompiled. And let's look at what the dependency file that was generated. Well, all it does is it depend, it generates the dependency information in make file format for util.o. Well, it depends on util.c and util.h. So it's just a nice way to manage all that dependency information automatically for you. Very. Yep. Many people are uh, saying that the font size increase would help. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no way I can do that because it's a movie and there's no way in the, uh, uh, in Microsoft PowerPoint to change the uh, size. I apologize for that. Um, I'm surprised if it's not full screen that it should be. I really urge you to watch this in full screen because I think that would help if you're not watching it in, in full screen at the moment. Also, it will be available um, as a movie later and at that time you should be able to expand it. Yes, that's right. It, watching it. We're going to post it afterwards and so you'll be able to see all the keystrokes. Hopefully at that time we can make it clearer. Okay, so another thing that's commonly done with make files to make managing a package easier is to um, actually have the make file provide some documentation for the user. And just hold on a minute and we'll get to that. So we can add rules. So for example, the rule help. And the rule help is going to simply print to the screen some help information about how you can use the make file. In this case, we're going to print a, a message, um, make ex1, builds the executable, and, um, and then information about the uh, tags file.
Now when I run make help, well, you notice that it actually prints everything twice, once with the echo and then the actual message. So make has these uh, little extra options you can put in front of rules to turn off the automatic echoing of what it's going to do next. So you usually put that in with the help messages so you don't see them twice like that. Okay, so, so far I've shown how we can build an executable and you're supposed to be thinking that util.c is actually hundreds of C files. The next step is making libraries. So usually you don't want to have a lot of .o files lying around. You want to manage them in one or a series of libraries organized around the organization of your package. So I'm showing now starting the simplest way, the command line way that one can make a, um, make a library and make file. And then I'm going to refine that uh, to make it more effective. So we have lib, which depends on the object files. And to generate lib, you run AR and uh, list the object files. So that works fine. It ran AR and generated the uh, library from those two um, things. Someone wants to know what are e-tags again? So e-tags are, is a database that's generated that Emacs can then use to find um, functions in your source code and um, do searches in your source code. All right, now we're in trouble. Now we're in big trouble. Okay, I'm going to have to um, fix this. Okay, so what happened was uh, PowerPoint has only limited ways of uh, interacting with uh, pre-recorded movies and I uh, messed up the pre-recorded movie so I have to manually go in to the location I was before to get this to work. Okay, so here we are again. We can make the AR file with uh, the command as written. Now a drawback to this is if a single object file gets changed, then the AR command gets run again and it has to regenerate the entire archive using the object, uh, all the object files. And we don't really want that. What we prefer is that if a single object file gets changed, then only the library only gets updated uh, with that one object. So this is the syntax you can use for that. And all it's doing is saying that um, libex depends on all these objects and putting these parentheses around means that the archive library depends on each of the objects. And if any single object gets changed, it'll get recompiled and put into the library, but the other ones won't get recompiled or re-put into the library because they know they haven't changed. Now I realize for some of you who have been using Make for years, this is elementary, but I wanted to go through it in an elementary way to provide the motivation for why we use these kinds of tools and how they're organized. So let's go back and change the uh, uh, .h file yet again and make sure that the uh, dependency uh, information is working properly in the make file. Okay, so I changed the .h again. When I reran the make, it recompiled the one file and put it in there. Now I rerun make yet again. It knows it doesn't have to do anything. Uh, there's a couple other rules that people always put in make files, a clean, and what that is, it's going to be project dependent, but it's supposed to get rid of generically things like .o files and other generated files that you don't want to leave lying around all the time. So in this case, I'm just going to have it do a remove of uh, objects. Then when I do a make clean, it just deletes those, those objects. There's also a rule people commonly use, real clean, which um, removes things like libraries, things you don't normally want to remove. And, and real clean generally depends on clean because we want it to remove the basic stuff plus the things you want to clean out like, like the libraries. So next I'm going to show you how you can manage um, 
building dynamic libraries or shared libraries in, um, in Make uh, quite easily. So the syntax for doing this is kind of similar to before. I'm just saying my lib ex one dy lib, which is the Mac notation for a shared library, depends on objects. To generate it, I run the C compiler or C linker with a particular flag dynamic lib. The output is the name of the file, the library file, and the import is again the object files. Now, uh, shared libraries are things that generally do need to be rebuilt uh, when you change the objects because they have additional information in there. And I'm showing you a little more syntax that makes, um, uh, means you have to do less retyping in, in make. The uh, syntax of dollar signed um, at is a replacement for the name of the um, target that you're making. So in this case, libex1.dylib and the uh, dollar sign hat is a replacement for the dependencies, these objects. The whole goal of using these types of variables is not to make life confusing for newbies, but it's actually so that you only have to put information in a single location, because if you start putting like a list of object files in one place, and you, you have to maintain that same list in a different line of your, um, of your make file, after a few days, you're gonna get out of sync and you're going to get annoyed. So the real goal is to make sure that all pieces of information are provided in a single location and then every other reference to them refers back to them. So if you change the values at the top, you don't have to go hunting around in the make file and change them in other places as well. Questions? Yeah. Um, can you talk about the difference between make file picking up environment variables versus variable definitions being passed to make as arguments? Um, that's a good question. The uh, make has has a uh, order of priority for for variables. You can list them as are listed in the top of this file, right at the top of the file, like CC. You can set them as environmental variables with bash or C shell, and you can also pass them in at the command line. When you pass them in at the command line, they have priority over both the shell and the make file. So if you do make CC equals GCC then that'll just overrule what I've written in the make file here. It's kind of a little counterintuitive because you see it here in the make file, but it'll overrule it. When it's an environmental variable, I honestly actually don't know because I prefer never to have uh, compilers and flags and other stuff as environmental variables. Too often people forget they're there and then build in an environment they don't realize that they're actually building with. So I much prefer to manage them explicitly and not put them in the environment. Some people like to put them in the environment. That's okay if they can manage that, but they'd have to go and check the priority because I'm not sure about the priority for if it's in the environment. And then there was one more uh, comment that you mentioned, uh, you will show depend files, but this person did not see them. Oh, um, I must've gone through that too quickly. What the uh, dependency generator does when, when the compiler compiles code, it for each .c file or .f, well, actually .f doesn't really matter in this case, but for each .c file, it generates a little file that lists exactly the dependence which include files that c file depends on. And then by including that in the make file with this include depths option that you see in the make file right in front of you, that means that the make file now knows the dependencies and can take into account what it needs to compile or recompile. I think we should slow down on the questions because I still have a bit to go. Okay. okay, so now I'm, um, I made some change and I just want to verify that the dependency information is working correctly to build the uh, library. And not going and recompiling when it doesn't need to. Okay, so, dang, I messed up and I got to go back to the movie again. I apologize for that.
Okay, so next what I'm going to talk about is an issue with the make file I've written so far is that the make file isn't portable. So if I were to take this make file, which works great on the Mac, probably would work great on anybody's Mac, and try to use it with uh, Linux without making any changes, it wouldn't work because some of the compiler options may be different for the different systems. So the way to organize that with make files is first is to take any information that's machine specific that can change and put it up at the top of the make file as variables. So I'm just going to do that for the two options for building the um, shared libraries and for the name of the um, extension for the shared library because the extension on Linux is not dylib, it's .sl. So I'll just make a variable to the top extension and I'll call it .dylib and I'll make another variable at the top for the flag that's needed to make the shared library which on Apple is dynamic lib. And then in the make file, I'll replace the explicit use of these um, values with the variable. The goal is that all the rules in the make file are machine independent, and we only have one area where there's values that are machine dependent. And in the simplest system, if you're making some software for you and a couple of your buddies, it's perfectly acceptable to stop at this and to just say to your buddies, okay, if you want to run on a different system, you just go into the top of the make file and you change a few of the variables to match what's needed for your, for your machine. To go a little bit further than that, instead of putting them in the make file where it's mixed up with other things, often what is done is to put them in a different make file that's included by this make file. And in that other make file, you only have those particular values. God dang. All right. This uh, PowerPoint is really annoying me now. Sorry about this. It, it should, when I press the mouse button, it should just be stopping and starting a movie. But sometimes it believes that it, uh, that I want to actually go to uh, the next slide. So backing up a minute, there's some other material here. I'm going to skip this about using tar and how you can use tar for make files. You can look at it later. It's less interesting than what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the make file and I picked just one variable just to make life simple. I picked the variable CC and I don't want to put it in the make file anymore because I want the user to be able to change it. Of course, in reality, sorry, this is more than annoying. In reality, we want to manage all these variables so they're portable, but I'm just going to do the one to make life simple. So we put an include makefile config in there, and then in the makefile config, we just set that value, and now make will work in the usual manner. But this is only the first step, because in general, if you're doing a large package you want a lot of people to use, you don't want them all to have to go in and put the variables into the makefile config themselves, because there's going to be a bunch of those variables, and most users are not going to know what those variables should be set to. So the GNU autoconf is a tool that helps set up those variables for you automatically for any particular system, and so the user doesn't have to manually go in and do that. So what you do is in your in your make file, you make a
this is getting uh, hopeless. Instead of having a makefile.config, you make a makefile.config.in that the tool is going to replace variables in it with variables that it figures out for you. So what you do in the in the in file is you put the variable name with a at symbol before and afterwards. As, I, as I've done here. And then you have to write a configure file. Now, a lot of people think that uh, auto con um, configure files that you write have to be very complicated. In fact, they don't have to be. They can be quite clean and small. Usually they look complicated because people get them by taking other people's and cut and pasting them and not really understanding what they do. So what I'm doing is I'm showing how you can write a complete one by hand for here to do just this single variable. So what you do is you make a file called configure.in, and it always starts with an AC init that's just telling the uh, autoconf that it's initialization. And autoconf has a bunch of rules, things it can do. So one thing it can do is it can look for programs. So in this case, AC check progs is simply looking for the programs that I've listed here, Clang, GCC, ICC, XLC. If it finds one, then it's setting the variable CC to that value. AC prog CC actually goes and checks the compiler that was set into CC and makes sure that it's a valid C compiler. ACC sub ST simply tells you that when I run this, when I run the configure, it's going to go into that makefile.config.in and replace the at CC at with the variable that's been set here, which would be Clang or GCC and so forth. The ACC config files is just telling uh, autoconf that that's the file that I want to do substitutions in. So now we've created this file. Now we run autoconf. It automatically looks for the file configure.in and generates a configure file. And now we'll run this configure. And let's see what happens when I run the configure. It says it's looking for a clang. It fi found the clang and it created a makefile.configure. I made a mistake here in the capitalization of make. That's why I'm having trouble finding the thing. But let's go and look at what it, what it did for a makefile.config. All it did was put in a cc equals clang. So that's great. Now I'm fixing my mistake here. And I'll show you a couple other um, options for the um, configure. You can pass in CC, you can pass in the name of a compiler, and that's the one it'll use. The file still doesn't exist, so what happened here? I forgot to rerun autoconf when I changed the configure.in file. So when you change that file, you have to rerun autoconf to get a new configure, and that's why the configure is still generated with the wrong file. But the end user, someone who you're distributing the code to, generally never has to run autoconf. You just run it and then put it in the file that you include. So now I'm running configure and I put in um, a compiler that didn't work and the configure stopped and told me that it didn't work. The final thing I want to show you is also using the features of, of configure. But what this is, it's, it's source code dependency on the system as opposed to compiler or tool dependency on the system. So for example, the file string.h is not universally available on all systems. Some systems have string.h, some have strings.h, some have both. And there are obscure things like this sometimes that you need to know about when you're writing source code. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an if def in the C code, depending on whether the file exists, and do something different whether it exists or not. So if defined have string h, then we're going to include string h. And then down below in the source code, we'll make a little change that depends on string h. Of course, this is an artificial example. We don't really care about string h, but it was just something I could come up with. So now the source code will be built properly 
if string H is available or if string H is not available, just by putting these if defs into the code. By the way, I don't recommend putting if defs in except when you really need to. So you shouldn't do it unless you really need to, but sometimes you really need to. Now the question is, how do I make the information about whether string H is available or not visible to the code? And that's another nice feature of AutoComp that can manage this. So in addition to finding programs and doing many other things that I'm not talking about here, you can check for include files. So there's an AutoConf check uh, for a header file. You just put in the name of the header file, string.h. It'll check for that. And then you also need to put in a, a file that's going to, where it's going to put the information about whether it found string.h or not. So the header file, config header file, much like config files. And in this case, I'm just going to call it config.h, which is a common name people use, meaning it's a generated file that's generated by the configure. You have to also make a dummy configure.h.in. And what you do in that is you just put in the variable undefined. So in this case, have string h, you put in undefined have string h. And much like with the make.configure.in, the configure tool is going to replace this with either uh, a defined have string h or an undefined, depending on whether it found it or not. Okay, so now I'm going to include configure.h in my source code. So that it depends on it. I got to rerun autoconf because I changed the uh, input to the autoconf program. Now I'm going to run configure. And you notice more out output this time as it goes and searches for a few headers, including the one I asked for. Once you ask for one, it goes and finds a bunch of them. And now we see that it's actually changed my configure file, configure.h, to have that header information that it's visible in there. So uh, configure can do many similar things like this for managing machine dependent um, systems as well. I just tried to show you in a simple way a couple of simple ones. CMake provides more or less the same functionality in some ways a similar way, but in other ways quite a different way. And like I said before, there's fans who prefer configure and there are people who prefer uh, CMake. I'm not going to get into the argument of which one's better than the other. So in conclusion, I just have a couple of slides that show the various things I talked about and I tried to provide some motivation for them. The first thing is editing tools that are commonly used. Emacs and Vim are the most commonly used and they provide simple tools for helping search through source code. With Emacs and probably with Vim, you can compile directly from within the compiler and find, and it helps you get to compile errors and so forth quicker than manually going from a shell and then hunting through the files to find where the failure happened. IDEs have all kinds of stuff like that, including things like code completion, syntax checking. They'll even compile the code as you type it in, and so you don't have to go back and, and restart the compiler, and as soon as you make a mistake, it'll tell you. They're very powerful. One difficulty with IDEs in the, in the high-performance uh, computing environment is there are oftentimes many people developing code on the same package and it ends up that a lot of the development systems become lowest common denominator because you have to be able to, anybody has to be able to contribute to it. And you could make the rule, okay, everybody has to use Eclipse for this project, but often that kind of, that kind of rule is difficult to make. So in my experience, not very many people use IDEs. Perhaps that should change. Um, I'm very interested in understanding if there are ways where you can have development where some people work with IDEs and other people work with Emacs and so and how they manage the make and the compile and, and so forth. And CMake has one advantage in that it can develop um, 
it can create the information that's needed by the IDE to help the IDE compile quickly. This can also be done with other tools, but it's, it's more directly done with uh, CMake. Then I talked a lot about uh, Make and GNU Make, which provides rules for compiling code, handling dependencies, computing dependencies, and how you can use um, it also to make libraries, to provide help information. And I skipped the part where I made the uh, distribution tarballs again in Make. The goal with Make is to kind of put all the things that you would end up typing over and over again in the shell to make them rules in the Make so you don't have to constantly remember what, what you have to type in or make small mistakes as you do it. Uh, make is slightly more portable and simpler to read than GNU Make. Uh, I think you should use GNU Make when you need it, but you shouldn't use it if you don't need it. In the same way, if you're in a very simple environment and don't need to use AutoConf or CMake, I don't think you should use it. If you start getting into uh, uh, a package that requires a lot of tests for portability and so forth, then you definitely want to start using those tools. I didn't show you, but GNU Make also has conditionals. So you can, ifs directly in GNU Make, so you can actually do simple portability checks in GNU Make, like for instance, um, setting the uh, extension for a dynamic library. You don't really have to do that with configure or CMake. You can just put the uh, conditional right into a GNU Make file. And if your package is simple, that's probably the best way to go. But once the packages become more complicated, you want to go on to using the higher level tools. So auto tools are a wider package of tools. I only talked about one, AutoConf. For HPC and what we do, I believe that AutoConf is generally all that is needed. I don't recommend using the auto make and using the lib tool and so forth. They're complicated. They require a lot more time to learn. For a very large package that's very, very complicated, generating a lot of libraries with a lot of uh, machine-specific details, you, you may want to use those tools. But that usually doesn't come up in HPC world. And then I skipped the part about tar, but you should put rules in your make file to generate distributions and so forth with uh, tarballs. Um, thanks for coming today. And a reminder, the next um, before that, there are yeah. a few questions. That yeah, I, we'll, uh, I'll take those as soon as I do this. The reminder that the next webinar will be by Jeff Johnson on distributed version control. I really urge you to, uh, to see that one. It's, uh, Jeff does a really good job in presenting. Okay. The, thank you, Barry. Questions? In using a wildcard-based make file, when one encounters a compile error, is there a way to figure out at what stage in the make file the error is happening? Could you repeat the question? I didn't get the first word. Um, when, if you're using a wildcard based make file, ah. then, and you encounter a compiled error, can you figure out at what stage the error happened? Well, the, um, in general, when you run make, it will print the, uh, uh, error message, including the file where it detected the problem. And like I showed, Emacs and IDEs can automatically jump to the source code where that happened. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer the question. But finding out which source file I think is, is usually, usually it's printed in the error message. The drawback is, of course, when you get hundreds of error messages spewing in front of you, trying to locate one particular one inside is difficult. Also with the, the um, parallel make, which I do recommend using, though I didn't give the option to how to do that in this, you can look it up very easily. There's two options for parallel make. One, it just shows how it compiles everything without trying to coordinate between the different compiles. And so the message is kind of jumbo, jumbled. And when you get errors, you can't be sure which, which error is associated with which compile. But there's an option for GNU make at least the newer GNU makes where you can tell it to coordinate the output, which means that the error messages associated with a particular source code will always be listed right next to that source code file. So you can find the errors quickly. And I urge you to always use that option, should be the default generally in my opinion. But um, so that's all, that's all I can say. I don't... Um, 
Do you have an opinion on the K develop IDE? No, I haven't used it. I know a couple of Petsy users have used it in the past, but I don't know anything about it. And uh, this one is, doesn't CMake handle library extension for things like Unix, OS X, and Windows, and isn't that an attraction of CMake? That is an attraction of CMake, but CMake also has drawbacks. It's um, doesn't just work seamlessly like you would think and requires love and care, just like G, uh, GNU make and um, configure requires love and care by the developer who has to be an expert in it. Um, I think this is all the questions that we have. Oh, there is one more question just came. Um, did you mention recursive makes? Is that like having several make files for making subsections of code? Oh yeah, I did mention it. Um, I mentioned as it's considered nowadays not a good idea. So uh, I'll explain how we used to do this with Petsy was we'd have different source code in different directories. Each directory would have more or less its own self-contained make. And then at the top, you'd have a make file that would recursively call make on each of the subdirectories and thus run make on those. It sounds appealing in some ways. The drawback to it is that um, the different makes are not coordinated so that the um, it's hard to get parallel makes across everything. So it's recommended that one not do that now, but one can still have multiple make files. The whole trick is rather than having multiple make files that you call recursively from the top level make file is you have multiple make files that are all included by the top level make file. And then the top level make file does a complete analysis of what needs to be recompiled and what doesn't need to be recompiled across all those directories at the same time up front. Don't worry, that analysis is really fast. And then it can do parallel compiles for the different source codes in the different directories and within the same directories uh, very effectively. So you can really utilize the, all the cores on your systems for independent compiles at the same time. Thanks once again, Barry. This is Thank you. the end of this. And session. I apologize for the movie not working as exactly as I had hoped. Um, I do want to point out that there is a slight deviation in the next uh, webinar. It is not on a Wednesday. It is on a Thursday, though the time is the same. So the next webinar will be on June 2nd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time given by Jeff Johnson. And as Barry mentioned, this is about using the distributed uh, version control system and continuous integration. And Jeff really does do a very good job of it. So I encourage all of you to attend it. Um, thank you very much for joining in um, and helping us make this a success. And please feel free to uh, give us feedback. Make sure you registered uh, your presence today. And uh, as one of the suggestions came, we will probably make Q&A an ongoing resource for this series of webinars. So watch out for that. Thanks once again.